if you want to count us in. Okay, I just wanted to um, do a, uh, we've done this before, but a talk about um, software that you can use for astronomy. And obviously there's a lot of things that require software imaging, if you get into that, but this talk is more oriented to beginners really and getting started, things like learning the night sky, understanding uh, astronomical nomenclature and to also just understand what, how, the, how the night sky works. So the program I'm showing you here is called Stellarium and the good advantage of it, that it, or the best advantage is it's free, it's an open source program. Um, you can get, this is a, um, one runs on Mac, um, Windows and Linux, and it's um, basically available, I'm pretty sure, on the Apple Store. And um, if you're on Android, it's not in the Android Store, but there's a um, program, which is, do you know what it's called, Stellarium, also via the same people, or is it different people? It's by somebody else. It's a, it's a yeah, thing. but there are a bunch of, um, programs for both Android and Apple. Um, this is the desktop, um, a desktop program. If you get hold of it, it's um, download it from stellarium.org. Don't go anywhere else because you don't know whether you might end up with malware or something. So that's the official website. The first thing you do when you uh, get hold of any of these programs is you have to tell it where you are. Um, if you want it to relate to your local sky and also when. Usually they will default as far as the time to whatever your system time is. So, for example, date and time is what you'd expect. It's just picking that up from the system, but you can change this to whatever you want because uh, one of the beauties of these programs is you might want to see what's the sky going to look like next month or... Um, for planning your observing ahead. You can even go back a few thousand years or forward a few thousand years if you're interested in wondering what the sky will look like. And now over long periods of times like that, there are noticeable changes in star positions. Um, even though it looks like the stars are fairly fixed, they are all in motion and especially the closer ones are moving relatively faster relative to the more distant stars, that's just an effect of, of the fact that uh, you've probably seen anything close up like a car moving past appears to be moving a lot faster than a jet aeroplane in the distance. So it's the same sort of thing at the extreme distances of stars, they appear to move quite slowly, but um, if you measure them over a long enough period of time, you can see they're moving. And the near ones, nearby ones like Alpha Centauri move the most in general, and which is what you'd expect. And you can see changes over, you'd probably see a change enough to notice after a hundred years or so, if you're a careful observer. But, um, so we can use these programs to investigate that sort of thing because they take what's called proper motion into account. So the actual movement of the stars relative to each other on the sky so what I'm going to do here, or the other thing, obviously, you just have to tell it where you are. But if you, for example, you're travelling to the Northern Hemisphere and you wanted to plan your trip and want to do some observing in the Northern Hemisphere, you just select somewhere in the Northern Hemisphere to explore the sky there. So you can um, see that it gives you a list of cities that you can just select from. Um, I've got Auckland, but if you don't want a city, you can just put in the latitude and longitude. And you notice this um, looks quite busy, but we can make it look a bit more realistic. We can start turning all of these markers off. Whoops, that was the wrong thing to click. So, we, um, fortunately, to turn the star labels off, we have to go into here and... Labels and markers will say no. And we want to turn off deep sky objects as well. 
So um, I've left the camp. I'll leave the compass points on. You can um, turn those off as well, actually. But um, I thought I'd leave them on. Oh, I've still got a, um, a line on the sky there. That's the ecliptic. So we want to turn that off as well. So we go into markings, take off the equator and the ecliptic. And if you do that, it's, it's rendering the sky, it tries to render the sky pretty much how you would see it yourself. You can um, get it to allow for light pollution even by adjusting how, how far deep you want to go when you've got this um, sort of wide angle view like this so that it basically will look more or less like you'd see from your backyard. And even in this mode, you can still find out what things are by clicking on them. So, for example, uh, Alpha Centauri or Rigel Centaurus, as it's known as. And it also tells you more information about it as a double star. Is everyone aware of that? Alpha Centauri A and B, I think, is Alex here. So you were looking at that earlier. Could you see the two stars? Yes, very slow, very far. Yeah. yeah. And the interesting thing is the orbital period of those two stars is about the same as the time that Uranus takes to orbit the Sun. So over a few decades you can see a definite change in the position of the two stars. And the orbits aren't circular, so they do get closer to each other and further apart. So um, sometimes they're not so easy to split because of that. You've got other information it's giving you about the stars gives you the magnitude. So it says the magnitude is 0 0.1. So is everyone familiar with the magnitude system? We've got somebody down the back, Alex knows. <laughs> okay, so the way it works is it goes back to ancient history. The, one of the earliest known star catalogues was made by a Greek astronomer called Hipparchus. And he plotted the positions and brightness of around about a thousand stars that he could see from Greece and he wanted a way to classify the stars so the, the ones that he thought were the, the brightest he called first magnitude and then he went all the way down to sixth magnitude which was the ones that he could just barely see so that's where that magnitude scale goes back way back in history so to modernize it it was made into a proper scale where it goes beyond six because with a telescope you can see much fainter stars. Things like the Hubble Space Telescope and long exposures can see stars below 30th magnitude. So um, every um, five magnitudes difference is a hundredfold in brightness. So by the time you get down to 30th magnitude you're looking at really faint stuff. And to handle things that are much brighter, you go to negative numbers. So the sun is about minus 26 in the same scale. So why is it back to point one? Could he not see that from Greece, obviously? Oh, no. Um, the point one is the actual modern value of it. So it's brighter than magnitude one. And then I think Sirius is a negative magnitude. Um, and Hipparchus would have ranked those stars all the same as magnitude 1 because he might have seen, be able to tell they were a little bit different in magnitude and brightness, but he just gave them the same ranking. They were the, the really bright stars. So it's not a, he didn't have any way to actually scientifically measure their, their brightness. So it was just a ranking system, but it, the system was just modernized, if you like. So magnitude zero is, is brighter than magnitude one, magnitude minus one brighter again. And you can have fractions of a magnitude as well. If we um, swing around here, you can see it's rendering the Milky Way there for us. And um, one thing, I'm not sure how well this comes up on the big screen, that star the Antares, or it's... Um, yeah, you can even see the text. Um, I'll just click on another star so you can see the difference. Yes, do you see that's a sort of an orangey looking colour? I'll click on a different star and then you can see the difference. 
you should be able to tell the difference there. So what Stellarium is trying to do there is to show you the temperature of the stars. So the whiter they are, the hotter, and the redder they are, the cooler. And it also displays the text using the same colour scheme. So um, if you're into um, getting into slightly more scientific stuff, notice the um, one of the things here should show, see where it says colour index, B minus V. So that's um, blue minus um, ultraviolet, I think it stands for, or, or Oh, sorry, visual, which is green, isn't it? Sorry, yeah. So the difference between the brightness in blue and the brightness in green is basically giving you an, an estimate of the color te what's called the color temperature, and you can use that to approximately get the surface temperature of the star. It isn't super accurate, but it's a common way of representing the colors of stars. Other information we get here, you can see uh, um, we've got the right ascension and declination. And you notice it gives you two different lots here. There's one that's got J2000 in brackets, and the other one is the right ascension and declination of the date. Does anyone know what the reason for that is? Uh, this is because of what's called the precession of the equinoxes. So um, what happens is that, um, I'll just explain what these coordinates are. If you're um, familiar with latitude on the surface of the Earth, so if you have zero latitude, you're on the equator, 90 degrees north, you're at the North Pole, 90 degrees south at the South Pole, and Auckland's roughly minus 36. Well, the same scheme is actually mapped onto the sky, but it's on the sky it's called declination. So instead of the Earth's equator, you have the celestial equator, and that is directly overhead the Earth's equator. So essentially it's just the Earth's um, latitudes projected onto space, and the same, the North Celestial Pole plus 90, South Celestial Pole minus 90. That one's relatively simple to understand what's going on there. The other one, called right ascension, is similar to longitude, so it's a way of telling how far east or west something is. So the problem with that is you haven't got a convenient marker like the poles or the equator, so you could have anywhere as your starting point. So um, on the Earth for longitude, for reasons of, I guess, the British Empire, <laughs> we ended up with um, Greenwich as being the origin of, of longitude. So I don't know if anyone's been to Greenwich Observatory. There's a, I believe there's a marker on the ground showing you the, the line of um, zero longitude. And it's measured around the uh, uh, in, um from zero to 24 hours. So you have a similar scheme on the sky, but the problem is, is where do you set the origin? So it turns out, and we can turn these lines back on again. We'll go back into markings. We'll turn the equator back on. I actually will use the equator of date. I didn't finish explaining this J2000 thing, which you can see there. So that's what I was going to try and explain if I go to the ecliptic of date. So we now have two lines, and you notice that they, and we'll put the um, constellation labels, do we want art? No, we'll put the labels back on. Um, actually, let's go forward in time a bit. Okay, so um, I said there was a lot, one of the lines was the equator and the other one is the ecliptic. So the ecliptic is actually, it tells you the path of the sun across the sky over the course of the year. 
so basically as the Earth orbits the Sun, the stars behind the Sun change as the, as the Earth's going around the Sun. So effectively that puts a, a path through the stars and that's called the ecliptic. And the reason it's called the ecliptic is because when the Moon happens to be crossing the ecliptic at the place where the Sun is, you get a, a, um, either a lunar or solar eclipse. Um, if it's on the same side as the, um, of the Earth as the Sun, you get a solar eclipse. If it's crossing at the other side, you get a lunar eclipse. The reason it doesn't always happen is because the Earth's orbit is slightly tilted to the ecliptic. It's about a five degree tilt. So most times um, at a full moon or a new moon, um, the moon is either above or below the, um, the sun in the sky, either the sun or the Earth's shadow on, if it's on the other side. So that's the ecliptic, and it's really defined by the plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun, which doesn't change much. It does actually bob up and down a little bit. It's caused by um, the gravity of Jupiter and Saturn, but it's quite small compared to the other thing I was going to talk about, which is this equator. So the equator is defined by the rotation of the Earth, so the north and south pole, and the, so the Earth rotating, that gives you the poles, and the equator is just is splits the two. So it's effectively the Earth's equator projected onto the sky. And that one isn't, isn't stable, and this was realised again by Hipparchus, who discovered that this... Um, he didn't... He, he was not a, um, a Copernican, so he thought that the, everything was orbiting around the Earth. But he did notice that the um, position where these two lines cross, in other words, you see where the stars are making circles around the sky, and the, which defines these um, equatorial lines. For example, if you had a line on a star on the equator, you can um, figure out where the crossing point of the two lines is. And he noticed over from earlier Babylonian observations that the crossing point had moved. Um, and you can see here you've got the constellation Aries, constellation Pisces, and Aquarius. So when Hipparchus did his observations, the crossing point was in Aries. And that is the basically the point of origin of the uh, right ascension. So um, it's called the first point of Aries. You may, have, may not have heard of that term. Um, it's also currently in Pisces, and eventually it'll move into Aquarius. I think under some astrological thing that's already in Aquarius, but they don't um, use the same scheme as the International Astronomical Union. So um, basically this is caused by the Earth's axis of rotation isn't fixed in space, it slowly wobbles like this, like a top. It takes 25,000 years to complete one complete wobble, if you like. So um, over that time, the crossing point will come all the way back to where it was in 25,000 years. So um, not many of us will be around by then. So, um, yeah, so that, that is the origin point. And if I turn on, if it'll let me do it, I turn on the equatorial grid, you can see, I think, that it's got zero hours up there, which is that line of right ascension that passes through the crossing point. So um, that's, whenever you look at any celestial object, like the moon, that one's a bit hard to read. I'll have to um, change the time so it gets dark. So we'll put the sun below the horizon. Now we can read um, that um, we have a uh, declination and right, uh, right ascension, 19 hours and minus 27. So the moon at that point is south of, well south of the equator. 
And you notice that um, it's even further south than the ecliptic. So that's what I was saying, the lunar orbit is actually tilted to the ecliptic. So sometimes it's um, south of the ecliptic and sometimes north, depending on exactly where it is in its orbit. Okay. What else can we do with these things? If I go, um, let's go to um, the morning at the, mo at the moment. Actually, I'll come back to the current time and go to the morning before dawn. Whoops, I got, went, went way too far there, sorry. Uh, I want it to be dark though. So um, we can see that um, we have in the, this is the sky at half past five in the morning, you can see the planet Jupiter, planet Saturn, and you notice that the planets have, uh, stay pretty close to the ecliptic, not exactly on it, because the orbits are tilted slightly differently to the Earth. But you will always find planets um, along the ecliptic line or fairly close to it. And we could see that tonight if we go back, we go at another time in the evening, we can see um, Venus and Mars. Not too late though. So you can see Venus, which um, the juniors were looking at in a telescope before, and the planet Mars, which is nearby. And um, people wonder why Venus is so bright and Mars is so faint. And it's just because um, at the moment Venus is overtaking us, and so it's getting closer to us. As it gets closer, it gets brighter, but at a certain point it becomes a more and more crescent phase so we can see less of the surface, so it'll reach a point of maximum brightness and then start to dim off as it, as it overtakes us and then reappears in the dawn sky. Mars, though, is actually way on the far, nearly on the far side of the sun and the Earth is speeding ahead of Mars. So um, um, Mars, if you looked at it in the telescope, you'd see it as a tiny disk. Um, but because it's just one planet out from us, when, when it's on the same side as the Sun as us, um, imagine the Sun here, Earth and Mars, that's when Mars is at its closest. So that's the best time to look at Mars, but you only get a really good view about a month either side of that, and then it, um, it rapidly becomes smaller apparent diameter in the sky and harder to see any detail. So um, oh, one thing I did here, one thing you can do here, which you saw, I turned these grid lines off and on, so it shows you the the right ascension and the declination lines on the sky. So sometimes that's helpful if you're um, trying to figure out where, get an idea of where something is, if it's south or north, so which side of the sky it's on, east or west, that kind of thing. Turn that on. The other thing you can do on this program is, for example, we um, centre it on Venus. So um, one of these buttons down the bottom tells it to centre the object. And now we can scroll in. And you can see that right now, did you see it like this before? Any of the juniors who looked through the telescope? It's quite a thin crescent. Yeah, so it's being rendered there. So just like Venus, like the Moon, it has phases. And um, obviously as it's coming to, towards us, between us and the Sun, that crescent gets narrower and narrower. And whereas when Venus emerged, first emerged from behind the Sun, it would have been a full disk. So um, we can... Um, as well as zooming in on um, planets, you can see it's um, rendering stars. This one's going down to eighth magnitude. Um, and, um, oh, hang on, I'll just stop that scrolling. Where's the center button? So um, you can set it to go down to about, um, if you download all the um, extended catalogs, I think it goes down to about. 17th or 18th magnitude, but you end up with quite a lot of disk space being used. Uh, 
and we can zoom out again. The other thing we can do is turn on um, deep sky objects, which is what we're often interested in looking at. If we, um, I'll just bring the time back. The, um, the yellow circle with dots, that indicates a type of star cluster called a globular cluster. And then, oh, sorry, that's an open circle, is a, sorry, an open star cluster. The circles with crosses in are the globulars. So, for example, this one here is the um, Sagittarius um, globular, Messier 22. And the green ones are what are called emission nebula. So um, those are basically glowing clouds of gas. So, um, for example, the one I picked here, the Omega Nebula, Messier 17. So this is area around um, Sagittarius and Scorpius is looking towards the centre of the Milky Way. In, in the winter, that's the best time to, to view it because it's high in the sky in our winter. They do also have these dotted outlines indicating dark nebula and um, and other features of the Milky Way, for example, the large Sagittarius star cloud and then there's Bard's window where there's sort of like a, um, a gap and you can see there are sort of darker looking areas that are actually not areas where there's intervening gas and dust blocking the view of the stars in the Milky Way. One of the more prominent ones, I don't know if it'll show up on here, but we can scroll right over to the Southern Cross. Yeah, it does actually show it. I might, I'll turn all the lines off to make it a bit more obvious. Um, so the stars here, so there's the Southern Cross. And then you notice there's a kind of a dark area here. And when you look on the dark night um, away from the city, you'll see that dark area next to the Southern Cross and you can see the glow of the Milky Way everywhere else around that area. That's called the Coal Sack Nebula. It's quite obvious from a dark sky site. Definitely down in Waharau you can see it. <laughs> so you get all these um, dark nebulae it's a bit of a fun one actually. I don't know whether it shows up on here, but you can actually see it on the back wall. If you turn around, um, this is a um, photograph on the back wall was taken by a member, Emmett Campbell. You can see right in the middle there is, is what is unofficially known as the Galactic Kiwi. And you see just below where the projector is, there's a dark line coming down. That's the beak of the kiwi, and then there's a couple of more dark streaks below the body of the kiwi, which are the legs. Can you point that out, Warwick? That's one leg. Another leg coming down from there, and then the body of the kiwi is above that. It said that once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. <laughs> Yeah, that's the more sort of semi-official name for it because it does, if you look at it by just the dark area, it does look a little bit like a pipe. And it's something else when you look at it from Australia. Oh yeah, um, this whole, all of these dark um, areas in the Milky Way uh, extended across that whole part of the sky is known as the Emu in Australia. That's an Australian Aborigine uh, um, indigenous um, thing. So they saw an e a, a big emu in the sky going all the way from the Southern Cross all the way to um, towards Altair, I think. I don't know that that shows up very well. I think I have seen it shown on the planetarium where they can adjust the contrast a little bit to make it um, what you'd see from a really dark sky site when your eyes are well adjusted. Oh yeah, um, that's the other symbol here I didn't mention. 
in Stellarium, it shows an oval orange circle or red, reddish looking circle. So those are the, that's the symbol for a galaxy. And you'll notice at this scale you don't see many galaxies. But if we zoom out, we should start to see a lot more appearing. Because most galaxies are pretty faint. The Magellanic clouds are an exception because they're close to us. We can actually see them with the naked eye. Sorry? You can zoom in on it. Um, some of them you can, some of them will show you like a picture. Let's, um, let's try, um, um, let's go into, well, let's go back in the year a bit. We'll look at a really prominent galaxy. Um, go back to, say, April. And come around to this side of the sky. Um, there we go, that's Corvus there. So, so the Sombrero, so this is Messier 104, sometimes, um, oops, I need to center it before I zoom in on it. It should show some sort of a picture, so yeah. So um, it, it doesn't really do that for the fainter galaxies, but for a lot of the um, more prominent ones, Stellarium will um, try and render them. Uh, Messier 83 should be another one if we can, probably quickest, just to go M83. That's the other thing in here. You can um, just type in the names of things. Right, so there's a nice spiral galaxy, the southern pinwheel. So, um, yeah, this is a great tool for exploring the sky and learning some astronomical concepts. Um, there's actually a heck of a lot to this program. Um, it also does ephemerides, so you can... Um, for example, um, select a comet, for example, that was something I was looking at for some reason, and we can say um, plot the position of, or calculate the position of the comets every so often. So um, calculate, and so I, I've only given five solar days, let's make it a bit, bit longer. Oh, okay, that's only, how many is it doing here? Oh, I have to put, change the two date. Instead of May, let's go, I don't know, and then recalculate. So it gives you a few more points. And you notice that it's actually plotting the position of the comet on the sky as I did that. So if you hear about a um, new comet, this program won't necessarily know it. So what you do... Um, you find out the name of the comet, first of all, make a note of it. You go into this um, configuration window, select plugins, and you see there's plugins for doing all sorts of things. So for comets, we do the solar system editor, and then we configure, and we can um, tell it to import. Um, from the Minor Planet Center, so you can either do asteroids or comets. So any, any new ones, it actually will go download from the Minor Planet Center at Harvard University. Um, they keep their database update of any new comet discoveries. Somebody says, oh, there's going to be a new comet visible in the sky next year. You can go on here, download it, and then um, use Delirium to see whether the comet is going to be favourably viewed from New Zealand or wherever you happen to be. And they, they usually, comets usually come with brightness predictions. Oh, except that it didn't select it. Well, actually, it might have had it in the, if we go back to the ephemeris. Um, oh, yeah, it gives a magnitude estimate. So this comet is... Um, not going to be seen visually, it's a photographic one at that point. Magnitude 16. So you'd need an extremely large aperture telescope to see that visually. Um, but it's well within um, 
photographic range. So there's all sorts of cute little tools like that. There's another one, um, one of those plugins called Oculus. Uh, you tell it what your telescope is and what eyepiece you're using it with. And you, um, it will um, draw the, um, a circle, basically the field of view you'll see in that eyepiece through the, whatever telescope you specified. And you can see here, you can, um, I don't know whether you can, oh yeah, you can change them here. So I went to a longer, fo a different focal length eyepiece. You can change to a different telescope. And you notice the circle is changing in size because obviously different telescopes with different focal lengths and eyepiece combinations give you a different field of view. So if you want to give an idea what your telescope will show you with a given eyepiece in it, you can use this feature of Stellarium to display that information. So, one of the nice little features. Um, some, of the, uh, some of the things I was turning on and off, you can do from this um, controls down the bottom, like we can display meteor showers. Um, if we bring it to a different part of the sky, let's... You know, there's none, none in the sky there at the moment, but that's supposed to turn, can show satellite hints of the more, in fact, this is showing a position of a satellite. So if it's date, you keep the database up to date, you can figure out where satellites are in the sky. Um, what else can we do? I, I mentioned search window. Things that you can't change with the major buttons, you can turn on and off in here. You can um, even do sort of gimmicky things like twink stars twinkle or don't twinkle. Um, you can set how bright the um, stars you want to display. So for example, we can limit the magnitude. And we've got information about the objects in the solar system and how they're displayed. Deep sky objects, so here we can select different catalogues, so the Messier catalogue, it's displaying that. Caldwell C is the Caldwell catalogue. NGC, the new general catalogue. IC, the index catalogue. And you see there's a whole bunch of others you can turn on or off of a particular type of object you're interested in. We can also do um, sky culture. So the default is modern, which is basically the IAU, International Astronomical Union stuff. For example, we can go to Maori if we want to. And then when we um, have a look at um, some of the stars, for the, uh, if there's a... Uh, it should oh hang on I have to turn the star names on don't I? Oops wrong one. Go back to here. Uh, it may not have that many names loaded on it. I'll just um, change to the morning again. There's one down there. It's got Mars showing. Is it Mars? Oh where where did you see that? Oh right, yeah, it's got so it's got the um, Maori name for Mars. If we um, if we go to the uh, morning, we should be able to see some of the ones we hear about, like Puanga and so on. If we um, want to go into the east, oh yeah, Timarama, that's the moon. Yeah, I think I'm not sure why it's not turning some of them on. Uh, maybe it is, maybe I just didn't have it. Oh, hang on, I better check what date I've got, I guess. <laughs> oh, it's because I'm back in April, <laughs> I forgot. Okay, now that's making more sense. So yeah, there's a Matariki there. The windows are quite hot there, 
Yeah. Sorry? I think a lead is not going to be quite well. If we drill in on it, let's have a look. Oh, yeah. So it's... Yeah, it's... Uh, when you zoom in, it's rever reverting to the IAU-type names. Anyway, and you can also turn art on and it shows somebody was asking about this one whether it was wrong in Stellarium that it was being depicted upside down. Possibly is. You could contact the developers on their mailing list. Oh, actually, Mark's not here. He was here earlier at the uh, Young Astronomers meeting. So it seems a bit strange they've got a walker, but it's upside down. If we go back to Western, you'll see there's a lot more artworks available for there. Stellarium will accept artwork. You can um, submit your own artwork if you're into that sort of thing. Um, we can go change back to modern. If it'll let me, what's going on here? Oh, it was just slow. Oh, it's got my own artwork there. So that's um, basically modern constellation art showing things like Pegasus, Hydra of a water snake, Argo Narvis, things like that. The Phoenix, I guess that is, Horologium, the clock. So, yeah, quite fun to play around with some of this stuff. Now, um, there's a couple of other things I wanted to mention. Um, one problem with Stellarium is that it doesn't allow you to select specific catalogues and stuff. It's just got its own built-in stuff. So there's a program which is also multi-platform called SkyChart, or um, its proper name is Carte du Ciel because the author is French. But... Um, this one um, also um, renders the sky, but it's a bit more um, less arty and less realistic looking than what Stellarium tries to render. But what this is useful for, you can, in this program, it's also free. You can, if you Google Cart Do Seal, you should find their website. The thing with this program is you can sp select specific um, star catalogues. Um, if you're crazy enough, you can even select the Gaia DR3 catalogues. Huge download, and it, um, each one is broken up into chunks to handle bits, bits of the sky. But uh, a really useful thing for this is that if you like working off printed star charts, this is much better than printing from Stellarium, because Stellarium, you'll get too much solid colour, even if you negate the background. Um, it'll still waste a lot of ink. If this thing is designed for printing charts, so when you print, it prints, obviously, the background sky is white, so you're not wasting ink, and it only shows you the stars and other objects using the inks. So this program is much better if you like printed ch uh, star charts. Um, otherwise, it's got a lot of the same features. Um, I didn't mention, but this program and also Stellarium, if you have a, a go-to telescope, an electronically controlled telescope, both programs can be used to control the telescope. You have to install an extra bit of software called ASCOM, um, which is another freeware program that um, basically provides the low-level interface to the telescope mount, or you're really connecting it to the mount, so the you can do things like select a, an object on here and then we can go telescope slow and the, if you had, had one connected up and functioning properly, the telescope would um, go to whatever you pointed at on your uh, star chart. We got any voice activated ones yet, Steve? <laughs> that was just a joke, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Go to, just tell your telescope, go to Pluto. Sorry? Could be a project. <laughs> yeah. 
So, um, one other thing I was going to do is um, what I have to do is um, I'll just um, do a, a quick um, demo of one off a phone. So, I, hopefully, I can get this to work. Um, I've got a program that allows you to um, uh, connect your phone to the laptop. Hopefully it will work. Okay. So you just do it through a web browser. You run an app on the phone. Uh, what is it? Dot fifty four. Okay, now somewhere. Find where it is. Uh, mirroring. Whoops. I'll probably ask for permission to do that. So what that? Um, unfortunately, that's um, only showing sort of like a little box, which is representing the laps, laptops. Sorry, the phone screen. But what I should be able to do is I was just going to show a phone app. The one I'm using here is called Sky Safari, which isn't a free one. But um, it's not a very expensive app. And um, you can see if I click now, it goes to the current time, or I can go in increments of forward an hour like that, or if I can change the period into days, months, or whatever I want. And whoops, accidentally killed it. Uh, sorry. I have to bring it back up again. Didn't mean to do that. Oh yeah, there are different versions, and yeah, the top version has got more features and so on. The, um, version, the best one, plus. The plus one, the pro one, you don't need. Yeah. Yeah, every so often they have a cheap rate. But one of the really good things about this one is it gives you really good object information. I showed you the information in Stellarium and it had position, brightness, all that sort of stuff. This gives you some written information as well. So we go object information and it gives you a big blurb. For example, I've um, chosen Lambda Scorpii, which is one of the stars in the tail of the scorpion called Shawla. And see, it gives a, a big blurb of information um, telling you about the object and, and heaps of information about it. All of the really bright stuff and common objects that amateurs look at, Stellarium gives really good information on them. Not Stellarium, I mean Sky Safari, sorry. So, um, yeah, if, if you don't mind paying for it, this app is actually really worth it. Oh yeah, my, that's the other thing about the phone apps. Obviously, you don't have to tie your location in with these because generally a smartphone will have a GPS receiver in it so it knows where you are. So by default, it will show you from your current location. But um, oh, what we can do is we want to turn... Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Go out of compass mode. Oh, hang on, I'm in orbit mode now. How do I get out of orbit? Sorry, oh, hit Earth, that's right. Sorry, I flew out into space there. <laughs> so we'll go back to Earth, and I meant to hit the, um, the compass button, not the orbit button. So what that's doing, if you can see, it's using the... Um, it's, there's a, a tilt um, detector on the phone... So um, once you've calibrated it, it figures out reasonably well where you're pointing. So if you're looking up at the night sky, you think, well, what's that? Is that a planet or whatever? You just aim your phone at it, and um, you can identify off the screen what the phone is pointing at. What's the best way to calibrate it? Figure of eight or turn it um, Yeah, I think, I think you do some kind of figure of eight thing. With the program running? Um, I think it tells you how to do it. I've, I haven't done this for ages, so... I can't remember what I did. Um, 
Yes, yeah, so I think it's similar to the Compass apps. Yeah, so um, that's a really useful one. And again, this will do um, telescope control as well. And in fact, that might be handier because if you're out in the field, a, a laptop can be a bit more of a pain to cart around than just having your phone. A lot of telescopes natively support Sky Safari these days. So it's a really useful tool. Right, so you have a Wi-Fi connection between the phone and the mount. Otherwise, you'd need a Wi-Fi receiver and some kind of um, connection. That program's really good for creating observing lists as well. So I do oh, that yeah. during the day, then when I get there at night, I don't just think what right. I'm looking. Yeah, we can, um, I just clicked observe on there and it's got a planner observing list. So you can record your observations and sessions and, and all the rest of it. So it's quite a good uh, observer's tool. I wasn't really meaning to do a sales pitch for it, but it, <laughs> it is worthwhile. Um, so any, um, any questions about anything, these programs or any astronomy type questions? There's something useful about Stellarium in that it's scriptable and it has a programming language. And if you learn the programming language, you can script it to make it do anything. But you don't have to learn the programming language these days because these um, GPT engines like ChatGPT and Bing Chat, you can ask them to write Stellar a Stellarium script to do something. No, okay, that's and interesting. Pretty good. Right. Because I wanted to make an animation, I thought, Oh, I've got to learn how to script delirium. And you know, that's like half a day out of your life. But the um, Bing chat did the script in you know, no time, and I got the whole thing working in less than half an hour. So these, these GPT things are pretty good. No, I haven't, I've never tried that. It's an interesting one. So I wrote an animation and just saved a whole lot of frames. Into a movie or whatever. Um, the, oh, the other thing you can, I didn't mention in Stellarium, I don't know if anyone noticed one other little feature that could be quite handy if you've got a fixed place where you always all do most of your observing, is that you can put like a terrestrial background on it. Um, if I come in here, um, landscape it calls it. So you can select different landscapes um, and you can do your own, like you can put in, for example, I don't know if that shows up very well, but there's actually trees there. It might not be, sorry? Go to the daytime. Oh yeah, that's a good point. It'll make it easier to see it. It shows up on my screen, but not very well on the projector. So we'll lighten things up a bit. So you can actually put these landscape um, around there so you know where, if you've got trees at it or a mountain in your way, you know I can't see that object because there's a tree in the way or something like that. So you can actually upload your own into Stellarium to represent wherever you observe from. I made one for a Kumu observatory, both inside the dome and the from the ground. Oh, yeah, yeah because the dome is a little bit higher, so um, you get a bit of an advantage. <laughs> and the courtyard, which is where most people would set up. That's mm. pretty accurate. Okay. Yeah, there are. Um, when something goes behind a tree on still air, that goes behind a tree on real life. Okay. So. Yeah, um, if you haven't got one of these programs, either a phone or a um, laptop, desktop type of system, have a go. They're great learning tools um, and observing tools, planning your observing sessions. I'm wondering when the next planetary conjunction is going to be, that sort of thing. So um, any other questions? About how much uh, disk space do you need for the um, It depends. The basic thing is, is still reasonably large, a few hundred megabytes. Um, it's not gigabytes, but um, it gets bigger if you 
Um, if, if you want to go deeper and deeper, you go into the tools and um, to find where it is. Um, somewhere, where is it? Oh, yeah, that was the scripts thing that um, Tony was talking about. Oh, we, oh, maybe it's under information. I'm looking. All right. Somewhere you download more stars. Is it under main? No. I've lost the thing. Yes, it's basically your star catalogues that take up the space. Yeah, so you've yeah. Got more star catalogs the more, more stars objects. you have, because it has to store quite a lot of information about each star. And if you go to hundreds of millions of stars, then, then you um, end up taking a lot of space. Ah, oh, here it is. This is where you do it. It's under extras. So um, I think it goes down to about catalog number five of, of default. And then you want to go deeper, you just click this button, get next catalog, and it goes down as far as nine. I've, I've, um, so I have, I've got down to seven, and then there's eight and nine to go. And it actually tells you the catalog eight if I download it. That's another 292 megabytes. And it covers magnitudes 15 through 16 and a half. So that gives you an extra 50 million stars. <laughs> um, in that other program I was talking about Cart Do Seal uses this has its own catalogues but Cart Do Seal uses the more official ones like from the US Naval Observatory and the Gaia um, DR3 catalogue is available now I don't know if you've heard of the Gaia Space Satellite it's been doing an astrometry mission measuring I think it's one and a half billion stars to really high accuracy, their positions and other information about them, proper motion, colour, things like that. And so um, the catalogue for that is so big, they don't give it you as one catalogue. You download for sections of the sky, so you end up with a whole lot of catalogues to cover the whole sky. So you, your programme then only has to load the part of the the catalogue for the part of the sky you're interested in. And um, that other program I was showing before, the one called Cart Do Seal or Sky Chart, that will accept the Gaia catalogues as well as the, the various US Naval Observatory ones and a heap of other different catalogues. You download those if you're out in the field, you don't need an internet connection, or do you? Still no, um, it'll work without internet once you've got that um, set up. Okay. Yeah, so it doesn't need internet um, once you've you've downloaded everything. Yeah. What about the phone one? Does that come on? Um, I think again, it's got the local database. I'm pretty sure. Um, I don't know whether you can download extra catalogs with that. Maybe the pro one you can. Um, I don't know that you can with the plus one, but it's it's quite a big download for an app. It's um, if you're out in the field where there's no internet connection. Oh well, usually it'll have all the info you need already, okay. but it does use up quite a lot of space on your phone for that reason. I think the download is something like 300 megabytes, whereas a lot of apps are only 10 or 20 megabytes, and that's the reason because works fine. I've got my phone on flight mode. Oh, okay. oh, sorry? It works fine on flight mode. Oh, okay, yeah. I don't think it needs internet to actually work. Um, uh, just one other question, is that a one-off purchase or is it a subscription? Um, I one think it's one-off, but what they tend to do is after so a year or two, they re put out another, you know, an upgraded version, and I don't think you get a free upgrade always. No, you don't. But, um, they're not usually worth it. Probably once every two big releases, they put something in that's worthwhile. Okay, thanks. Mm. Yeah, so if you buy the app, um, you basically just use it until uh, maybe uh, the reason you'd stop using it because it stops being compatible with the OS or something. But that should take quite a few years. Yeah, I've got the old version and a newer version on there, but they still work. That works Android and Apple? Yeah. 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 Okay, well, we didn't have anyone online with any questions, so in that case we'll 
call it a day. And um, if you missed me mentioning at the beginning, next week is at the University of Auckland. Um, Dr. Ryan Ridden is going to do present this year's BHT lecture. And he's doing a tour of the country to do that same lecture at different cities. Um, some of you may not know what that is. Beatrice Hill Tinsley was a New Zealand born astrophysicist and she did a lot of work in galaxy evolution, dark matter and things like that but she very unfortunately died at a really young age from melanoma and so a trust was set up in her honour called the BHT Lecture Trust so each year they have an invited speaker to tour New Zealand giving an astronomy lecture Sorry? There's a picture of her there. Yeah, right there. Right there. Oh, yeah, that's her there. Yeah. Um, yes. Thanks, Bill. So, yeah, oh, um, does, the lecture at the university is free, but you want to book at event, Eventbrite so that you're registered. Is that on Monday? Yeah, Monday. It's earlier. It's at 7 p.m., I think. Um, I'll send out another reminder notice anyway. Um, sometimes, hard to know, sometimes there's plenty of spare seats for these lectures and other times the lecture theatre can be completely full. So if you want to go, it's better to book early because sometimes a lot of university students go to these lectures as well. <laughs>